One of the difficulties in moving forward in life, one of the difficulties in, in progressing, in developing, is that we're chained. We're chained to the past. And there are three areas of being chained to the past that I want to look at. And when we're chained to the past, we can't move forward. It's not even, it's not possible to move forward. You can think about the forward. You can, you can dream about the forward, but you can't move forward if you're tethered to the past. The one is the area of, of negative experiences. We've all had negative experiences, and some people are able to move beyond their negative experiences quite quickly and easily, and some people find it very difficult and it takes a long time, and some people never do. We remain chained, we remain tethered to the negativity of the past. Sometimes it's things that happened in childhood, and sometimes it's things that happened in adolescence, and sometimes early adulthood, and sometimes later adulthood. We, we have scars, we carry with us scars of negative experiences and they chain us, they restrict us, they make it much harder to move into the future if we're, if we're limited by those negative experiences. The second is habit. We are restricted by habits we've developed over time and those habits become ingrained and it's very difficult to do things that are counter to that which has become habitual. And the third is, is fear. And, and fear is something that is part of our survival mechanism. It's, it's ego-related. And, uh, and fear also holds us back. We sometimes can't move forward because we're just afraid. And these three areas require different responses. The negative experiences we need to overcome with knowledge. The habits, the negative habits, we need to overcome with process. We have to create new, new habits. And fear we need to overcome with a different attitude. So there's knowledge, there's process, and there's attitude. Let's look at each of those three areas. The first area, we've had negative experiences. In a Shulchan Shur that I was teaching this week, we learnt a Chochmah Shlomo, Reb Shlomo Kluger, on Simon Memvov in Orachayim, where he talks about the brocha of Shasali called Tzorki. Every morning we thank the Rebbe Nishim for giving us everything we need. And that brocha is said specifically over shoes. So he's intrigued by two things. The first thing is, is it realistic to thank God for that we've got everything that we need? Do, do we really have everything that we need? Do we always have everything that we need? Does everybody have everything that they need? Because this is a standard bracha, it's in the Siddur. Every Jewish person says it every morning, no matter what situation. You could be, God forbid, in a concentration camp at the door of a, of a gas chamber, and if it's time to daven, you say, Shasali called Surki. How do you do that? What does it mean? What's in your head when you're saying that? Asks of Shlomo Kluger. And the second thing is, what's it going to do with shoes? And he says the following. There's an important principle that we're taught with this one little bracha. That you have to make a bracha on bad things just as you make a bracha on good things. And what does that even mean? Why do you have to make a bracha on bad things? There can be days when they're bad days. How do you say, Thank Hashem for giving me everything I need. This is an, not only an unnecessary brocha, it's, an, it's a dishonest brocha. It's not a realistic brocha. How are you saying that? What you've got to say is, and this is hard, but it's so important to be able to move forward, that bad is good. That's what you have to understand. The struggle and challenge notches up the level of Olam Haba that a person can get. We've got to look at struggle and challenge as working out. We like to hang out and have it easy. Sit and have a l'chaim and, and talk and tell stories, and, it's, and that's, that's beautiful. But sometimes you've got to work out. And the benefit of the workout is through the discomfort. And the more discomfort there is, as long as it's not a, a, a destructive discomfort, the more growth there is and the more development there is. So says the Reb Shlomo Kluge, one has to understand that the, the bad, when bad comes from Hashem, it is good when we do bad ourselves, when human beings do bad, that's pure bad. But when Hashem does something bad for us, something that seems bad, that, it, that his experience is bad, we've got to understand that, that within it is, is good. The Medrash says in, in, in Medrash Rabbah, Yitzchak was upset that his life was too comfortable. 
And he asked for Yisurin. He asked Hashem, I want to notch it up a little bit. I want to struggle a little bit. And from there he moves into why the shoes. And he says a tzaddik is called a walker. Holech, somebody who's on the move. The mi madrega le madrega. He moves from one step to another. He doesn't stay stationary. That's the nature of a tzaddik. You need shoes because you're moving. If you're stationary, you don't need shoes. Shoes are the instruments of movement. And movement entails hardship. It entails discomfort. You're moving from a place you're comfortable to a place you're uncomfortable. You need energy in order to move. You've got to get yourself together in order to move. And it's not just moving one foot in front of the other. You, there's that as well, but you consider movement, movement, moving from one situation to another, moving from one circumstance to another, moving from one country to another, from one job to another. There are movements that we make that are very discomforting, and we need shoes for that. That's what shoes are for. The challenges of life are the shoes with which we walk. They enable us to move. They, they move us from places of comfort. It's one of the tragedies of, of the human condition that we don't make changes unless we're uncomfortable. Now, you've got self-motivated people who create their own discomfort. They just get to a place and they start straight away, thinking that's not good enough, I need more, I want more. And their ambition creates the discomfort which drives the change. But if you're comfortable where you are, you don't move. And either one, one creates one's own discomfort, or sometimes the Rebbeinu Shalom creates discomfort. Hashem, Hashem creates the, the discomfort. And that's why we have to be careful. We, we know of this in, in so many different areas, particularly in the area when it comes to physical health. Sometimes you've got to change your lifestyle. You've got to do things that's not comfortable doing. But if you don't create your own discomfort, life will create the discomfort and you'll be forced to change your lifestyle. And that's in all areas of life. You don't want to wait until you're forced to change your lifestyle. You want to make the changes yourself. But to change your lifestyle, you need, you need to create discomfort. And the Yusurian is the propeller of change. It's the creator of discomfort. And that's the shoe. When we put on our shoes, we say, Shasali, cold, sorki, you've given me everything I need in order to walk. Everything I need in order to move away from where I am. Because where I am is okay for today, but it's not good enough for tomorrow. Where I am is sufficient for where I've come from, but it's not sufficient for where I want to go. And therefore, I've got to get out of bed and put one foot in front of the other and start moving. I've got to get into action. For that, I need shoes. And I need to understand that sometimes what drives me into action and what brings me into, into movement is Yusurin, is something which appears to be negative and bad. And that's why Hara'ah Havatova, even bad things, uncomfortable experiences, sometimes even painful experiences, ultimately turn out to be, to be Tova. And what's important is understanding this close relationship between good and bad, if you want to call it that, between uh, din and rachamim, between chesed and gevura. We've got this in, in all areas of the, of the Torah, where you've got these two poles, the kind and soft, empathetic side of Hashem's relationship to us, and the din and the gevura, the harder, more demanding, more challenging aspect of Hashem's relationship to us. And they're not two different things, they're just part of the same. They just work, they work in tandem with one another. There are times when Hashem moves us with kindness and empathy, and there are times when Hashem moves us with, with challenge and, and discomfort. But they're all the tovah, they're all Hashem caring about us and moving us forward. As difficult as it is to understand in the moment, it's all part of the working out process. And why the Gemara says, Chayav Adam Kishem tova. The most important word in that piece of Gemara, I've always thought, is the word Kashem. You've got to make a brocha on bad with the same energy that you make a brocha on good. It's not just you make a brocha. You've got to say it with the same joy. You, because something good happens, you say, Oh, Sheikh Yanubi, and everybody's very happy and it's wonderful. Understand. Then something bad happens. You say, Baruch Dayanemis, or whatever brocha that we. We say for the particular circumstance, and that's it. We, we mumble it. But there's got to be a certain simcha, even that kashem, that even in accepting the hard things, to be able to see in them that hara'ah havitova, that even bad is for good. 
that whatever Hashem brings us is, is for good. And this is very, very difficult. One of the hardest things in our Avodas Hashem, one of the hardest things in our service of God is to be able to accept the, un, the discomforts of life with a joy and a celebration of understanding that this is part of the process of moving forward, that we need that discomfort in, in order to move forward. Rabbi Limelech Biederman has become very, very popular and, and famous, has uh, published a, a Haggadah, and in the, one of the points he makes in the Haggadah is, think about Makas Dam, think about the first of the ten Makot. Because we know that later on, when the Jews are in the desert and they get a little rebellious, they say, Zacharnu et hadaga. we remember the fish we used to get in, in Tzrayim. That's, that's what they, they're eating, mon. Now, what could be better than mon? But that's not good. They remember the fish. He says, so fish was obviously their staple. That's what they ate in Mitzrayim. What do you think they felt like when every, all the water turned to blood? No more fish. What a terrible thing. And then what emerges? The only people who've got water are the Jews. How much could they sell a bottle of water for? Even more than they sell bottles of water in the stores over here for. You want to take a shower, you've got to go and buy water from the Jews. You want to drink water, you've got to go and buy water from the Jews. So what starts off as being a terrible calamity, oh my goodness, fish, it's gone, everything's gone, we've got no food. We've got no water, we've got no food. No, you've got a gold mine. You've got unbelievable opportunity. Because with hardship also comes opportunity. If we're able to understand that there is good in the bad, not just because the bad motivates us to move and challenges us and exercises us, not only that, in addition to that, in, in hardship, Jews are particularly good at finding the opportunities. In a recession, in a depression, in a war, the Jews find, find opportunities. They told me when we were in Australia that the reason that Bondi Beach area is all Jewish, not all Jewish, but largely Jewish, is because uh, during the Second World War there was the fear that the Japanese were going to invade Australia, and it was a really it was a very serious fear, and they actually began bombing northern parts of Australia. So all the people living in Sydney moved away from the coast. The way, what did the Jews do? They bought up Bondi Beach. <laughs> is it Ra or is it Tova? It depends. Do you look at it as an opportunity? As everything creates, every hardship creates an opportunity. What is your mindset? Or is everything just a tragedy and terrible? In every hardship, there is an opportunity. One has to find the opportunity. One has to look for the opportunity. But you need then to be looking at hardship through a lens of everything that is ra, also havitovah. That everything that is bad is also, is also good. That chesed and gevura are part of the same concept, part of the same construct. Din and, and rachamim, part of the same construct. But they're not, they're not separated out. When it comes to negative experiences, our avoider is to appreciate that in the hardship there is opportunity, that in the discomfort and the challenge there is the ability to, to make changes, to move, to do things differently. And, and it's a call to do things differently. When we're experiencing hardship and challenge, that's a call from Hashem to, to make some changes, to, to do things differently. What about habits, negative habits that keep us chained to the past? So here's where we've got the 10 steps. We go through the process of Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim. I'll show you these, these 10 steps, and they're, they're so beautiful, and they're so easy to see, not always easy to practice, but certainly easy to understand. And as you do this, I would encourage you to think of something that you would like to change in your mind right now. Think of, think of a habit, something that you're accustomed to doing that you would you would like to change, it's difficult to change. And as we go through these 10 steps, see how many of them are applicable. They're, not, they're often not all applicable, but of the 10 steps, many of them are applicable in, in how we go about making those changes. So the first is, how did Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim start? Where did the whole thing start? Well, it started with the 10 makot, with the 10, the 10 plagues. And what was important about the plagues was not just that they were hard for Mitzrayim, that they were difficult uh, punishments for, for Mitzrayim, but they caused anybody who was watching, it should be the Egyptians as well, and to some, at some point it was, to question certain assumptions. And Paro himself comes to a point where he questions his own assumptions and says, God is the true one, God is the real one. And he, he switches back to his old habits again. But it causes even Paro to question his assumptions. And the Jewish people also to question their assumptions. And Hashem says, Ko amar Hashem, Hashem. 
Moshe says in the name of Hashem, this is what Hashem says, with this you will know that I am God. That's what the Makos do. I'm going to turn the water in the river Nile into blood. And Rashi explains there, there was no rain. Egypt wasn't irrigated by rainfall. The river Nile would, would rise and, and deliver water to the banks. And that caused the Egyptians to assume that the Nile was the source of their prosperity. That was an assumption that they made. So the first thing that happens is the assumptions which were held to be sacrosanct have to be have to be challenged. And when you want to change something, you need to understand that your behaviors are rooted in an assumption or in a set of assumptions. And to change your behaviors without questioning the assumptions are very difficult. So if somebody is addicted to smoking and wants to give up smoking, there's an assumption that it's not harmful from wherever that assumption comes. But the person wouldn't be smoking if he didn't have that assumption. For whatever reason, he assumes that it's harmful. So the first thing is you've got to challenge that assumption. Perhaps it is harmful. Perhaps it's not. Well, I know lots of people who smoke their whole lives and they live till 105, so can't be the smoking that is the... But question that assumption. Maybe there's something wrong with that assumption. Because if you continue with that assumption, it's going to be very hard to change the behavior. The first thing we see in the Marcus is assumptions have to be questioned. The next thing that comes is Shabbat HaGadol, the 10th of Nisan, that year. They had to pull themselves away from Avoid Zorah. Here you've got to challenge not only assumptions, but you've got to challenge beliefs and values. That's harder. Assumptions, you, you can challenge an assumption with facts, but beliefs are something much deeper than that. And you have to question whether your values are correct, whether your belief system is correct. Maybe there's something in the whole belief system that has to be challenged that you've got to look at and, and, and question. And the, the Orachayim says, Mishchushim shechu me'avodah Chazal tell us in, in the Medrash that they had to, Hashem says, Mishchu, remove yourselves from idolatry. The Chazal is not telling us that the Jewish people were idol worshippers in Egypt. They were not. That they used to do certain things which were similar to what the idolaters do. We had in the Matmanim show recently the part in the Gemara that we're learning about that there are things we're not allowed to do because they are practices of the of non-Jewish people. They are practices of idolaters and we're not allowed to do those things. That was happening. They were beginning to do things that weren't Jewish. They were beginning to do things that were practices of the of idolaters. They weren't serving idols. Apart from telling the Jewish people, stop doing that. Hashem came with his wisdom, mehem to take out that the that element of, of negativity. To take the deity of the Egyptian people and to take the lamb, that deity, and do Avodat Hashem with it, do and, and worship God with that, do the mitzvot with that, do the korban pesach with that. So, so it's not just separating yourself from the Avodah Zorah, it's actually converting the idolatry into Kedusha. It's turning the negative into the positive. But it's at the level of values and beliefs that you're challenging. And the Orachayim is saying, although they didn't practice idolatry, there was some level of distorted thinking around the idolatry in the Jewish people. Some deep thinking about the lamb, about the sheep, and about its importance. It, if we're affected by our environment. And if the whole environment has a belief system, that belief system penetrates the Jewish people as well. We see that today with a lot of the belief systems that are out in the world and how they affect Jewish people and even religious people who are not necessarily testing those beliefs against the Torah and against Halakha. They sound good beliefs, they sound positive things, they sound uh, liberal beliefs about, about freedom and, and all good things. They, As you look at them on their own, there's nothing wrong with them, they're good things. 
But to, when one puts them into a framework of Torah, one has to question some of them and not simply admit them into the Jewish collection of values. We've got our own values. Our values come from the Torah. And in order to be able to change the behaviors, it was, a ne it was necessary not only to question the assumptions of, on which the previous behaviors were based, but also to question the value systems and the beliefs which drove those behaviors. And then the next step in the process is Vayishalu. They had to ask the Egyptian people for payment. And the Rabbeinu Bechaya says this wasn't borrowing. They weren't asking them to borrow something, which they never returned to them. It's Shishalu mehem b'matana v'akadosh boruch yutenem chen b'nei ha-mitzrim v'yitnu lehem. They were asking for unconditional gifts. Give us money. Give us, give us all your precious things. And the Rebbein Bichai goes on to say that the, the moral justification of that is they've, they've worked for a long time and they were never paid. They need to be paid. Uh, even when a slave is released, you've got to give the slave, the slave money. Ha but just imagine what it was like to be a Jewish person who'd, who'd lived as a slave for so many, many years. And now you've got to go and ask, not just for an increase, you've got to ask for payment. How do you do that? You're a slave. This is your boss. You've never been paid before. Everybody who, who, who works for, for a boss knows it's difficult even just to ask for a raise. It's not an easy thing, and you've got to justify it and explain, and it feels uncomfortable. It's not an easy conversation to have. Imagine going to your boss who's never paid you because the understanding is, back to the assumptions, is you're a slave. You don't get paid. We give you food and, and shelter, and that's, what, and that's what you get. You're asking for payment. And they say, not only payment, we want your jewelry, we want your all your precious things. We, we, we want the best. So what are you asking them to do? They're still slaves. They're not free yet. You're asking them to act as if they are free. And that's perhaps one of the most, of all the 10 steps, to me, this is one of the most, the most important and the most difficult. We think you go through the process and finally you're free and now you act like a free person. No, you've got to start acting like a free person long before you're free. Even while you're still dominated by old habits, you've actually got to start acting the new way. You've got to start acting as if you're released from those habits. You've got to have an idea of what the new life would look like and start living the new life long before you're free of the old life. That's part of, of, of what's required in the freedom. So you've got to question assumptions. Check what your behaviors, what assumptions your behavior is based on. Check your values. We just assume our values are all good. We got good values from our parents, but we've picked up other values along the way. Just check what the values are that are driving our behavior and then start behaving as if we're already in this new framework, as if we're in this new, in this new place. And then comes Kriyas Yamsuf. Kriyas Yamsuf means burning the bridges of getting, going back. And that's another hard thing to do. We like to leave options open. I'm going on Aliyah and if it doesn't work, I'll go back. Yeah, one can do that, but if you really want your aliyah to work, the best is to make it impossible to go back. And then you've just got to make it work. And if a person were to go into a marriage and say, you know what, we can marry if it doesn't work, we get divorced, not the end of the world. Not, not a good idea. If you're going to change a mode of being, you're going to change a behavior, the best is to be able to have a kriyas yamsuf. There's a point at which there's no going back. Between you and Mitzrayim, there's now a sea. And you cross the sea this way through some major miracle, it's not going to happen on the way back. When you come on Aliyah, when you come to Israel, there's a lot of siyat Dishmaya, Hashem helps you. It doesn't always help you to go back. Going back, you might have to do on your own. Sometimes one has to. There are all sorts of reasons for which a person possibly has to go back. And it's not just Aliyah. It's any situation of making a positive change in one's life, there are times when you have to you, you have to move back. You've got to take a step back. But to make the change on the understanding that you've got a way out, that's not going to work. You, when you're making the change, there's got to be such a level of commitment that you don't have a way out, you don't want a way out, and there isn't a way out. Then there's a chance of the change being able to be sustainable. And we see this changing is not, is not an easy thing. Look at all these difficult things we have to do in order to make it successful. And then what do you do when you've burnt the bridges? So think for a moment. There's a sense of loss. My old life is now gone. I don't have a way back to my old life. And I like my, I was comfortable in my old life. But for whatever reasons, I've decided to make some changes. So I make the changes. Okay, I've still got an option to go back to the old life. Then I cut the option. 
there's no option to go back. That's the point at which you feel loss. So what do you do at the moment of loss? As Yashir ben Yisrael. You take out a bottle of whiskey, you have a l'chaim, you put on the music, you dance, you sing, because you've cut off the way back. That's something to celebrate, not to cry about. That's something to be excited about. Because now you've opened the way forward. By, by closing the way back, you've truly opened the way forward. And that's a cause for celebration. That's not a cause for, for tears and for hardship. So although there's difficulty in it, of course there's difficulty in it, but the way to, to relate to that is with, with Shira. And what comes next? So now we've no way back. We're celebrating it. But now things get hard, as they inevitably do when you make a change. What are we going to eat? We haven't got a job. Where are we going to find work? How's this going to be? Now comes the mon. And the mon was laman anasenu. The, 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 the mon was not an easy thing. Mon was a test. It was a trial. It was, it was challenging. And what did they have to get in, in the mon? If you just look at the psukim. Vayamodu vaomer lo he'edif hamarbe vahamamit lo hechsir ish lefi achlo lakatu. When they went out to, to gather, no matter how hard you worked out in the, in the mon field, what you took home was the same as everybody. You took home what you needed. Depends how big your family was, how many mouths you had to feed. That's what you took home. It, it wasn't correlated to how long you spent in the field, how hard you worked, how big the containers were that you took out with you. No correlation. One has to learn that the Rebbein Hashem gives you what you need. That he gives you, yes, you have to go out and collect. The mon didn't come to you. You had to go out and work for the mon. But there's no correlation between the, the effort and the reward. You've got to do the effort. Hashem gives you the reward, but he rewards you on the basis of your need, not on the basis of your work. Think how hard that is. So now you have no food. Moshe says, Hashem says, don't worry, food is going to come. And then miraculously, food comes. An absolute nice. comes from Shemaim, and you've got food. So you can imagine what people are going to do. You know, tell the family, don't, don't finish everything. This is all we've got. We've got no food for tomorrow. This is all we've got. Says Moshe, Al-Totir, don't leave anything over. Eat what you've got today. And what about tomorrow? When you're going through change, you've got to stop one worrying about what about tomorrow. That doesn't mean you, you're not sensible and you don't have planning. And Of course you do those things. But your sense of worry... When you're going through change, you can't be worried about tomorrow. Tomorrow you'll work again. Tomorrow there'll be new opportunities. If you will be paralyzed if you become obsessed about the future when you're going through change. When you've lived in the same place for 50 years and you've had a job for a long time and you've got an established business and your children are married and everything is fine, of course you don't have to worry about tomorrow because you've got money in the bank. Tomorrow is fine. But when you move, when you make a change, you do start worrying about tomorrow. You don't have for tomorrow. He says, Moshe, don't worry about it. For Lord Shamuel, Moshe, and the people didn't listen. Of course they didn't listen. How are they, how they going to listen to that? And they left some over. And it went off. Moshe was angry that they weren't able to let go of tomorrow. Just let tomorrow happen. Then they got into the cadence every morning. Each person would gather what they needed. And then, That's like quite a humorous part of the Pesach, isn't it? So now everybody's taken. And now you look out of the window and you see the fields are still full of mon. And what do you have to do? You've just got a little bucket of mon for today. Not even anything for tomorrow. But the fields are still full. There's plenty out there. Just let it melt. Just let it go. Let it melt. Don't worry about it. It's not for you. This, uh, this ability when one's going through change not to become obsessed with the insecurity of the future. There is insecurity about the future, but not to become, uh, not to become obsessed with that. And then what comes next? Next comes Amalek. There comes a place, where, a time where you've got to face your demons. Where, okay, so now you've got it, you're not obsessed about tomorrow, one day comes, another day comes, you kind of work your way, the change is working, uh, you don't know how exactly, but, but you're managing, you're coping, everything's kind of alright, and then something goes really bad. Now Iran's got a nuclear weapon, and now we're, now we're really worried about, about what's going to happen, and we have to face it.
and the the Mishnah says in, in Rosh Hashanah, where it says they go into battle and they they, they confront Amalek, and and Moshe stands with his hands. It says when I'm, when Moshe's hands were up, they were winning. When his hands were down, they were losing. Is it his hands that made the difference? To realize that when the battle time comes, because there will be battle times when you're going through changes, there will be times when you hit friction, when it's not going so easily, when there are things that get in the way that begin to obstruct you. And at times like that, you've got to have him winner. At times like that, one's got to be willing to say, if you look upwards, there's hope. The Rebbe will, will, will work something out. These are all tests of emunah. When you go through a change process, to do it without emunah is incredibly hard, if, if at all possible. You need siyat etishma. Hashem needs to help you. And that's why one needs to be sure when one's going through change, that one's doing it for a good reason, that one's doing it for the right reason, so that one can get some of that siyat etishma. And even if Amalek comes, we've got to face the demons, and we've got to face it with emunah, with belief that we will overcome this too, because this is what Hashem wants for us. And then comes the eighth step. Then Yisra appears. And what does Yisra do? He restructures. Now if you want to retain the new behaviors, you've got to change the structure of your life. So if you used to every morning, you would come back from shul and have a cup of coffee and a cigarette, you've got to change the structure. It's not that good enough just to say, I'm not going to smoke. Don't have a cup of coffee when you come back from shul. When you come back from shul, you know, do the dafyomi first and then have breakfast and then have the coffee later. Change the structure. In order to keep the, the process, there's a whole restructuring of Am Yisrael. You can't be structured like you were back in Mitzrayim. where You've got little shuls and little minyonim and there's no, there's no proper structure. You can't be structured the way you were as you came out of Mitzrayim. Now it's time to start creating a structure for the future. So you've got to look forward and say, how should my life be structured for the life I'm going to, not for the life I'm coming from? And if each of us look at the structure of our lives right now, today, the chances are our lives are structured to serve yesterday, because that's when the structure is developed. Not always is the structure of our lives really fit for where we're trying to go to. And that's hard to change the structure in advance. You've got to change the structure before you're there. But if you don't change the structure, you don't get there. And people who do restructuring in business understand that. You don't wait until the business is in real trouble and say, oh, we need to restructure. You say, where we're going, we're looking at creating a different kind of a business. The business we're going to create is going to be global. It's not going to be local. The business we're going to create is going to be virtual. It's not going to be whatever, the, whatever it is, the changes we make. We've got to make the structural changes now so that we can move into the future. And so Yisra comes with the structural changes needed for a nation who's going to live in their own country and are going to run a proper legal system and a proper government system. And he creates that system well, well in advance. And then we're ready for Har Sinai. All of this happens before Har Sinai even. Seven weeks. Now we're ready for, for Har Sinai, where we start with a new sense of meaning, new purpose. Why am I doing this? Who am I doing this for? Now we get into the philosophy. It's so interesting. We didn't start with the philosophy. We started questioning the old philosophy. Then we looked at physical changes, changes of behavior. Then we come into, okay, so now what's it all about and what's it all for? That really is the essence of Nase Vinishwa, isn't it? First make the changes, Nase. First make the changes. Then Nishma, then figure out why afterwards. Because if you try and figure out why before, you'll spend your entire life philosophizing about whether the changes should be, shouldn't be, why the changes, for who the changes, when the changes. Sometimes you've just got to do the changes. You've got to make the changes. You know where you're going. And then when, you, when the changes are made now, so what is the meaning of my life? This new life that I've created, who's it in service of? Why are we here? That's how Sinai leading ultimately to Eretz Yisrael, we were able to establish ourselves as a free and independent nation in Eretz Yisrael with all of this change having taken place already. And all we now have to do is, is put it into, into action. We have to fulfill it in, in Eretz Yisrael. And you'll see most of this covered in the Dayenu. This whole process is the process of Dayenu. The ten plagues, you challenge their gods, their values, all the assumptions about them. 
And you gave us their money. We had to be paid as free people, not to be as subservient as slaves. And you split the sea and you gave us no way back. You took us in dry land and then you closed the sea and that was it. There was no way back to go. And you drowned our enemies in it. For 40 years, you provided for us. We had to develop Emunan Bitachon for 40 years. We couldn't plan for tomorrow. For 40 years, we only had enough food for, for the one day. There was nothing in our cupboards. There was nothing in our refrigerators. There was no food for the children. There was nothing except what we needed for the day. And we were able to live with full Emunan and Bitachon. And you brought us to Har Sinai That's the whole process of change. Each one of those steps was necessary to get to the place of Eretz Yisrael. Hashem couldn't just take us from Mitzrayim and put us in Eretz Yisrael without going through the process of change to change the habits, the way that we lived as, uh, as people. So those are the ten steps that, that we looked at. Challenging assumptions, challenging values and beliefs, acting as if we're free long before we're free, acting in your changed status even though you don't yet, you're not there yet, burning the bridges, celebrating the burning of the bridges, having faith in the present and the future, facing your demons, restructuring your life, giving your life purpose and meaning, and then living a new life in a new place where you're able to bring everything that you've, that you've worked on into fruition. And then the third dimension that we're looking at is the area of fear and insecurity. So we talked about the area of negative experiences and that, that we deal with with knowledge. We need to know that a negative experience is a positive. If it comes from Hashem, there's opportunity in it. If it comes from Hashem, there's something good in it. The second is, is habit. And for that we have a process, this 10-step process of slowly moving out and changing the way we operate. And the third is the insecurity and fear, which is dealt with, with, with an attitude. And the attitude is an attitude that we see with, with Bedikas Chametz and with, and with Biur Chametz, which, which we have to do, which is interesting that there's a very fascinating piece of Zohar where the Zohar says in Parshas Tetzave that Matzah is it's a nutrient and, and it nourishes our Emunah. This is like a king, he says, like a king who has a sick child, an only child who's sick. One day this child wants to eat. So the physician said, yes, he can eat, but he can only eat this medication. He can't eat food yet. He's got to eat this particular food. And what we suggest is that until he's on this new diet of this new nutrient, that you remove all other food from the house. It's best not to have it there. If you want to go on, on diet, get rid of the stuff that you shouldn't have in, in the house. It just, it, it's better that way. They did that. Once he was cured, the doctor said, now he can eat what he wants. It's okay. So it wasn't a permanent situation. Now that he's cured, he can eat what he wants. When the Jews left Mitzrayim, they didn't know the root and the principle, the secret of Emunah. They didn't know how to do Emunah. They didn't know how to live with Emunah. This idea that you can only have food for today and nothing for tomorrow and not worry about it, they didn't know how to do that. Omar kut shabruche yitzamun Yisrael asvata. They need a medicine. They need a particular nutrient to give them that capability. And until they've eaten this, they shouldn't eat anything else. Once they ate matzah, which is the nutrient for emunah, the Zohar is worried about if chometz is so bad, why are we allowed to eat it all year except for one week? And if there's nothing wrong with it, why aren't we allowed to eat it that week? Says the Zohar, because when we came out of Mitzrayim, and if for each of us, we put ourselves back in that situation every year, we just aren't strong in, with the emuna capacity. Our emuna is not that strong. And one of the ways of strengthening emuna is through matzah. Isn't that unbelievable that a physical 
material thing like matzah, food, can nourish a spiritual capacity like emunah. In Sefer Vayikra, we begin to understand the interface between the physical and the spiritual. A korban is very physical. It's an animal. It's food. And yet it, so to say, nourishes our relationship with our Shem and, and, and our Neshomas. Koanim oichlim mubalim miskaprim. A koin eats, eats the meat from the barbecue of the, of the korban and magically the the person who brought the korban chatat is excused, is, there's a kapora. How does that work? Is something so physical can have some, something so spiritual an outcome. We know that spiritual things can have physical outcomes, but physical things can also have spiritual outcomes. And although matzah is just, it's flour and water, it's very physical, it actually does something for the emuna. And when we eat it, we need to eat it with that in mind. It's not just instead of bread, we're having matzah. No, there's also an Allah matzah. There's also a brocha for eating matzah itself because matzah is a nutrient for emunah. It actually helps our emunah. And if for seven days, and during that time that we're busy building our emunah, no chomet. While we're focused on strengthening that weak capacity and we're doing it through the eating of matzah, during that time there's no chomet. And that's also part of change. You've got to be fanatical in the beginning. Later on, you can ease up a little bit. You go on the diet, the diet has to be fanatical. You start on a working out routine, the working out has to be fanatical. You decide you're going to learn a certain quiz every day, you're going to do some learning, you have to be fanatical about it. In the beginning, you have to be fanatical. Until that gene is well developed, until that capacity is well developed, and then you can relax a little bit. You don't have to be so fanatical anymore. And so it is, Pesach is a fanatical time. We get fanatical during Pesach. And we get fanatical before Pesach. Getting rid of the, of the chomets. Because the chomets is that which interferes with our emunah capability. So we remove the chomets. Focus on the emunah. Build the emunah. And then we reintroduce the chomets into our, into our diet. And we know that chomets is about, is about comfort. At the end of the day, matzah and, and, and chomets are the same ingredients. It's just that bread has got some hot air in it. And that's why we talk about chomets as, as the ego. It's just it's the same ingredients, just with hot air. And, and it's nicer to eat. It's more comfortable to eat. It's easier to eat. It's easier to digest. So it's, it's the same nutrients, but bread has the comfort. So to develop the emuna, that's back to the idea of the discomfort that the Reb Shlomo Kluger talks about in the, in the beginning of tonight's year, the Shasali called Sorki to understand that sometimes discomfort is also part of what I need. The discomfort of matzah, get back to basics. All I need is flour and water, and with that I'm, I'm fine, I can manage. To get back to that level, and during that time, remove the chomets completely, no comfort, just keep away from the, from the comfort, just for a period of time, until you've developed the emuna, the capacity to live without comfort. Once you've developed the capacity to live without comfort, you can introduce comfort. The problem is when we're attached to comfort, when we're addicted to comfort, when we can't live without comfort. First, we have to detach from that. Once we've detached from the comfort, we can introduce it later on. And that's why the, the process of Bedikas Chomets, right in the very beginning of Masech Tepsochim, Rashi and Tosfus talks about the fact that Midoraisa Bevitul Baal Nasagi, that Midoraisa, how do you do, do Bir Chomets the way you do it, is just through, just through Bitul. The only way, you, all you have to do is be Mabatel. And there's a machlokus Rashi and Tosfus and other Rishonim as to what the bitul does. Bitul is nullify the chomets. How can you nullify it? It's there. You've got a loaf of bread there. How can you nullify it? And Tosfus' approach is you, you're detaching your ownership from it. You're detaching your interest from it. You're not nullifying the chomets. You're nullifying the chomets' connection to you. And that's what we've got during Pesach. That's what we've got to be able to do with comfort, is to be able to detach ownership from it. I'm not attached to it. I enjoy comfort. I'm grateful for comfort, but I'm not attached to it. I can live without it. That's what Pesach is to teach us. I can live without. You know, the people ask, ask a lot about what is and kidneys and not kidneys. And at, at the end of the day, the, the gazer of kidneys is because people had worked out how to be comfortable within the halachic framework of, of, of matzah. So you can make bread with other things and you can make cake with other things. And, and so Chazal's prohibition of kidneys was not just in case people come, it was actually you defeating the whole purpose of Pesach by creating all the comforts. And really, what's Pesach supposed to be about? Simplicity. Pesach is supposed to be a camping holiday. 
Just take a tent and go and camp and take matzah and, and just be simple for, for a week. Just be simple. So what do we do? And that's why Kittinius came in. If, if the people say we need a Sanhedrin to undo the Kittinius for the Ashkenazim, if a Sanhedrin came in, they would add a whole lot of other things into Kittinius. All the things that they have on the, on the Pesach programs, they would add that in and say that's also as well. They wouldn't make it lighter because we've done exactly what they didn't want us to do. We found the ways around to make it comfortable. And who are we undermining with that? We're not cheating God. We're cheating ourselves out of the opportunity to learn to live with simplicity, which is what Pesach is for one week. The idea was just live with simplicity. Detach from the need for comfort. And when you've detached from the need for comfort, you can reintroduce comfort into your diet. And we've messed it up. Pesach is to take us through an annual process of cleansing, of cleansing ourselves, of being tethered to that which is not necessarily good for us, so that we can master ourselves and be able to detach from that and begin a change process to a future that we design, not to one that is designed by our past and by our habits and by the, the things that we're connected to. And when you're sitting at your seder, to be aware of, of what that is, halach ma'anya, just to understand the simplicity and don't translate lechem lachma anya as bread of, of poverty just translate lechem anya as bread of simplicity it's just about simplicity and ani is not necessarily somebody who doesn't have anything and ani is somebody who doesn't need anything and just to be able to get at least your mind if your body is in comfort well so be it but at least get your mind into a place where you're able to say I'm enjoying the comfort it's wonderful but I don't need it Got matzah, got four glasses of wine, got good company, what more do I need? That's my Pesach. And once we've got down to that simplicity, we can slowly reintroduce the comfort and design futures for our souls that are the futures we want, the futures that we need, futures that are full of brocha and hatzlocha and good health for each of you, for each of us and our families. Good young tzach.